everybody. Summer bounty is upon us and I am processing apricots. I'm going to, some of these are going to get dried and some of them are going to get frozen for future jam. The ones that are pretty decent looking in terms of the whole fruit, I'm going to dry for our own use. And then <clears throat> some of this is going to be made into commercial jam later. So I have a pile here of scratch and dent that are going to be the jam and then um, and also ones that are slightly less ripe and then ones that are really ripe I'm putting in the uh, turn into whole or half dried apricot slices section. So this is the going to be the dried apricots. Um, if you have ever, apricots are one of my very favorite fruits. Um, I can remember being a teenager and coming home. We did not have apricot trees on our property. I'm not quite sure why, where I grew up in Northern California, but a friend of my dad's had offered him um, some apricots and I remember them going and picking them and there were just boxes of ripe apricots sitting on the back laundry room floor and me walking through there and just, they were dead ripe, um, really too ripe. And me um, just walking through and like grabbing three or four and eating them um, on the spot and them just being absolutely perfect and warm and um, yeah, just absolutely delicious. So I have loved apricots ever since then. They are one of my favorite fruits. They really need to be dead ripe to be great eating out of hand. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. Um, and so they're very sour and kind of tangy if they're under ripe. Um, and so I like them just right on the edge of starting to get mushy in order to eat them out of hand fresh. Um, but they are wonderful in jam as well. Um, one of the best compliments I ever had paid to me when I was still doing farmer's markets and selling jam was um, a person had bought apricot jam from me and then they had given it to their older elderly mother and sh then they came back to buy more jars from me because the comment from the elderly mother was, this is what apricot jam is supposed to taste like, which was so sweet um, and just made me thrilled. My jams that I make use a low sugar pectin and so they're less, um, less sweet. They're still plenty sweet, um, but they're less sweet than they would be if they were um, a traditional jam recipe that gets cooked down. And I think that using that lower sugar pectin really allows them to, um, allows that fruit flavor to come through. Here's an example of one that is not quite ripe. You can see the color is lighter and they're green. Um, but by the time it's turned into jam, they'll get cooked down with some sugar. That slightly less ripe is not going to matter. And the nice thing about slightly less ripe is they have more natural pectin when they're under ripe. Um, so which is actually good for helping jam set up. Um, I do, I'm just rinsing these because they came directly off the tree. So washing any dust that might be on there off and certainly looking for um, damage, looking for bird pecks, looking for bird poop, which is of course not what anybody wants in their apricots. But we got an apricot harvest for the first time in since 2019 this year. Um, apricots bloom very early. They are one of the earliest fruit trees to bloom. And so if you live in a place that tends to get late frosts where um, things look good and everything starts to grow and you get this kind of fall spring and then bam, you get this um, uh, late frost, it tends to nip the fruit just as it's forming on the trees when they're in bloom and you don't get a harvest. And that is what happened in 2020 and that's what happened in 2021. Um, so it was a tough apricot year for a couple of years there. Um, and then this year, I'll have some video of it. Um, the tree, we have two apricot trees, one blooms earlier than the other. The early one um, did not have any fruit. It did not set fruit. It, we had an ill-timed frost and I lost all the fruit on that one. Um, but the other tree 
slightly later blooming. Um, the fruit survived, which was fantastic and kind of unexpected. I thought I had lost it all. And then um, the, the whole tree just exploded um, with the weight of the fruit and various other things that I don't even know what contributed to it. Um, and so the tree split. And so we're gonna have to take that tree out and start over, which is a bummer because that tree is about 10 years old. So this apricot tree was probably planted in spring of 2012. And it's always had a bit of an issue. It Early on in the first couple of years, it leaned really far to the east. And I actually had it for a long time. I had it when it was small. I had it bungee cord to this fence to hold it more upright. Um, so it's never been super strong. It's always been a little funky. We have it near this stock tank. Um, where when we drain the stock tank, um, we the water goes here, and so it's a way of watering and fertilizing the tree, which we thought was a good idea. Maybe that's part of the problem, I don't know. But this spring, um, for the first time in since 2019, we actually got fruit on the tree, which I was super excited about. And then I came out here and I noticed that the donkeys were eating the branches off of the tree on the other side here, um, this way. And I was like, why are they eating the branches? Why are they able to reach the branches? What's going on? And so I went to look and this entire tree had split right here and you can see the crack. It actually split all the way down to here. Um, so basically the tree just split in half. Um, there was enough uh, strength in the tree that it didn't completely fall to the ground and it was loaded with fruit and so I asked my husband I'm like could you just like use some um, trailer ties and just tie that trunk together in order to see if we can preserve it long enough to get the fruit off of the tree um, and he ended up bolting it together he had some um, random stuff around so he bolted it here he bolted it through here which also was splitting and then he ended up chaining and strapping like all over this tree. So it's chained and strapped in like three or four different directions here because the whole tree was just literally falling apart. Um, amazingly, it never wilted. You can see there's another one here. Um, the tree never wilted, the fruit um, stayed on, and we managed to get a harvest out of here. So amazing. You can see this one, we weren't able to pull it completely back together. This tree is a goner, and we knew that when we strapped it. There's no way we're going to save it, um, not with the split as far down as it is. Um, so we're going to take it out once we finish harvesting the fruit that's on here, and we'll replant um, a different apricot uh, in this spot because I really like having apricots here. It's very nice to have the chicken and the sheep be able to eat the fallen fruit um, and it's it provides some shade uh, and it's just a nice thing to have on the north side of the building so that the neighbors don't have to stare at this big metal Quonset hut um, but yeah what a bummer um, you know a 10 year old tree that just split but again like I said it's never been super healthy it's never been really upright and maybe that's part of what happened um, we didn't prune it a lot and that could be also an issue I'm um, terrible about pruning fruit trees and so we'll come in and cut branches that are obviously crossed and things like that but we didn't do a lot of other pruning um, maybe it just got too leggy. However, um, if you look at this apricot tree, which was planted about the same time um, and is a different variety that's actually a little earlier um, blooming and so it didn't have any fruit this year because it got frosted out, this tree seems fine. Um, it seems really strong. It seems to not be having any big issues other than obviously donkeys and sheep chewing on the branches. Um, so yeah, who knows what happened, but really weird, but I am super psyched that we were able to at least save this tree, um, in enough to get the fruit off of it because I was super bummed that I wasn't going to get fruit for a third year, um, on apricots, which is one of my very favorite fruits. Um, so yeah, it's been a, um, you got to be dedicated in this area if you really love apricots to actually get some fruit. Um, but for me, if I only get apricots every couple of years, it's still worth it just because I absolutely love them. So we're going to dehydrate a bunch of these and then we'll have dried apricots um, for snacking. So what I like to do when I have a harvest like this is you're always going to have some fruit that's damaged either from you know just rubbing on the branch of the tree or from a bird pack 
or who knows what. Um, but there's always going to be some that's damaged and is not going to hold well um, and is going to get soft really fast um, and rot. And so as soon as I picked everything, and ideally when I'm picking it, although not always, I'm not usually that organized, um, I sort everything into um, stuff that is going to have to be processed quickly and stuff that can probably hold for a little while. And um, I've gone through, we, I've been, we've been working with apricots here for the last uh, probably a couple weeks. And so I've gone through these piles multiple times. Um, this one is really right on the edge of too ripe, but it will dry down lovely. Um, and so like all the ones that were seriously damaged, um, we often just left them out there and threw them to the chickens and the turkeys. It was really funny. We had turkeys running around the chicken yard with apricots in their mouths. It was hysterical. Um, they, turns out they really like apricots. Um, and then ones that have minor damage, I will put in one basket and ones that are perfect, I will put in another basket. Um, the ones that are perfect do not have to be processed as quickly because they can sit for a couple of days. Um, generally, I end up picking apricots slightly underripe on the tree, um, and that's just because the longer I leave them out there, the more likely that the birds are going to get into them, um, and I'm going to lose a lot of the fruit. And they will continue to soften up and ripen up um, once they're picked. And so I will pick slightly underripe um, and then sort and then process um, the earliest ones first. I have a walk-in cooler. Um, I use a cool bot um, to um, turn a small room into a walk-in cooler, which is a godsend for this kind of stuff. Um, and so if I want them to just hold as they are, I will throw them in the cooler and they will hold for a week, sometimes more than that, um, and, but they will not continue to ripen because they're refrigerated. And so if I want them to actually get ripe, I need to take them out of that or store them someplace at room temperature and just keep a really close eye on them and let them ripen up and check them every day and sometimes go through them every day. See, this one's got a moldy spot on it. I can cut that out and that's fine. Um, I know some people would not eat that, um, but I personally think it's completely fine, especially in something that's going to be dried or cooked. Um, I'm not going to eat it out of hand. Um, but yeah, so I sort into needs to be dealt with immediately versus this can wait a little while. Um, and so this was, and actually I ended up this year with three piles. There was the needs to be dealt with immediately, needs to be dealt with within a couple of days, and then, um, can wait a little while. And so this is the needs to be dealt with within a couple of days. Um, these have slight blemishes on them, slight damage, um, but really pretty minor. And so they're gonna hold pretty good. There's been a few that I've had to toss, um, but most of these have held up quite well and I'm not seeing much mold. I'm not seeing overly ripe fruit um, where it's squishy and just not salvageable. And so it's worked pretty well. Um, but if you've got, you know, a hundred pounds of apricots, it's very handy to be able to not have to deal with all of it in one day. Um, and so that's typically what we do. Um, our garage is, um, cooler than the outside temperature. Generally in the summer, it's slightly warmer than in the house because it's not air conditioned. Um, but if I want something to ripen up, I will set everything in my garage and just keep an eye on it um, so that I'm pulling stuff out as it gets ripe. I think, you know, you, you live to finally have your fruit trees producing and then when they finally do, you realize that what you've just strapped yourself with is a, a weekend of, you know, eight, nine, eight or nine hour days of processing fruit in order to put it up um, for the rest of the season. So it can be really overwhelming to get a ton of fruit all at once, especially if you're new to processing stuff and you don't, um, you're not used to handling it. I really need a second container over here. This one, a little green, 
but most of these are edible. Most of these I would eat out of hand. Kind of my definition of like, do I want to dry something is would I eat it right now? Um, if the answer is yes, I feel like it's ready to go in the dehydrator. If the answer is no, um, then I'm going to let it ripen up a little bit more because they're not going to get any sweeter or any riper sitting in that dehydrator. And so if, they're, if the fruit isn't great going in, it's not going to be great coming out. Um, if you've got kids that really love sour stuff, maybe you want to dry them a little under under ripe because they're going to be a little more sour. Um, but for me, for drying apricots, I like them dead ripe. In fact, I once had a friend give me a huge box of really overripe apricots and I threw them all in the dehydrator out of desperation and they were so juicy and they ended up dripping all over the bottom of the dehydrator, which is how I learned that the particular dehydrator that I have um, really needs a tray on the bottom and doesn't have one. And then the juice not only dripped all over the floor of the dehydrator, but it dripped towards the back behind the screen um, where the fan is. There's a, a screen to keep stuff from hitting the fan. And then I couldn't easily wash it because there was all this sticky dried apricot juice in the bottom of my dehydrator behind the screen where the fan is. I've since left a review on Excalibur's website saying, you guys really need to put a tray in here. Um, this is ridiculous. Uh, yeah, so learn the hard way that really, really juicy fruit makes a huge mess. Um, and now I line the bottom, even if it's just a piece of tin foil, to catch most of that. It's not 100% effective because it really needs to be a tray, um, but at least it's better than nothing. That one is underripe and feels soft. I think I'm just going to toss it. Hmm. And a lot of times there, fruit gets ripe from the bottom to the top. So the bottom will be the best bite and the top is going to be the least ripe. A lot of times I'm trimming off the very top of these because they're a little bit green at the shoulder. And so it's just an easy way of removing some of that. Also, a lot of times you'll get a little bit of a bit there left over from the stem that's not always great eating. So I just trim it off. The other thing I've been doing is just leaving a few sitting on my kitchen counter. That one's gone. And so these were really underripe from the last batch that I sorted. And so I just set them down on my kitchen counter to ripen in the house. And they are now very ripe. So that worked quite well. See that one's got, see that little tiny bird peck? Minor, minor damage, certainly couldn't sell it, but certainly fine. And that'll hold, like that kind of scarred over a little bit and that will just sit like that um, probably for three or four days before it starts to taste rot or get soft. So a little bit of damage is fine. And you can be as fiddly as you wanna be about stuff like this. This is just a little bit of scarring from something rubbing against the outside. Um, I don't worry about it. Um, but if you're making jam, you know, that might show up in your jam as, in terms of a visual. So you can trim off as much as you want. Generally, apricots, you don't peel them. Um, thank God, because um, that would really be awful. Um, so some fruit is pretty easy to peel. Other fruit would be really hard. In fact, I read a, a I can't remember where this was, but some comment from somebody saying that they had peeled. Yep, there's an earwig. And there's some rot. We're just going to toss that one. Um, yeah, saying that they had peeled their apricots before they made jam. And I was like, God bless you, sister, but not it. I, I don't know why you went to that level of work when you don't need to. So that way you saw that earwig come flying out of there. Earwigs are terrible in fruit. Um, this batch is a little more scratch and dent than the stuff I was doing earlier. You can tell that um, that's just gone. Um, but any little crack in the fruit, an earwig will get in there. And a lot of times they get in there and then it starts the rotting process. And so not only do you 
get surprised by a lovely earwig coming out, but you also end up with fruit that you can't use. Um, they love to get between pieces of fruit. If there's two pieces that are touching, um, there will be an earwig hanging out in there um, between those two pieces of fruit. Uh, so they are just ubiquitous. It's part of having a homestead and being on a farm. Um, people will tell you that earwigs are decomposers and they're really harmless and blah, blah, blah. And they have clearly never eaten or had an earwig come out of an apricot or had an earwig eat all the corn silks off of their corn so that it didn't get pollinated or um, eat the center out of their sweet basil so that it didn't grow correctly, which is what kept happening to me in Colorado. I finally gave up growing sweet basil because the earwigs would just mow it down. I don't know why. Um, so yeah, people who say earwigs are harmless have never really seen the destruction that they can do. Um, part of the problem is they really love mulch. And so if you're doing a heavy mulch to conserve water because you're doing a no-till garden for whatever reason, um, they will explode in population if you've got a lot of mulch. And so um, sometimes you can do a good thing for your garden and then end up with 100,000 earwigs. Um, a great earwig trap, if you don't have dogs, my dogs eat this, they find it and eat it. Um, so it's very hard for me to set these traps. It's just a like a tuna can or a cat food can, um, some shallow can, and you put equal parts of soy sauce, molasses, and oil any kind of cheap vegetable oil, mix that together, throw it in those cans, and the earwigs are wildly attracted to it, and they um, they climb in, and then because of the oil, they can't get back out. And it is astounding how many earwigs you will catch. They're very effective, um, and so you'll set one of those traps, and you come and look the next morning, and there's literally a hundred earwigs in a can, and you're like, I had no idea there were even that many earwigs out here. Um, so very effective. Um, a lot of people will say just put on, put down a rolled up newspaper, and then collect it, and they'll be in there, and that's true. Um, but then you have to unroll the newspaper. Earwigs come screaming out. Um, yuck. Yeah, I prefer the cans myself. Plus, I like to be able to see that they're dead and that I have successfully killed them. I'm not a fan. I used to be really, really squeamish about earwigs, and um, I've gotten over that over the years. There's just been so many for so long that I now will squish them with my fingers and not, not be totally grossed out by it. Um, still not my favorite thing to do, but I will do it in a heartbeat because I'm just so sick of them. They love any time type of little cracker crevice. Uh, Spinosad, which is um, a type of organic spray um, or organic pesticide, I think it does work on earwigs. I know it works on roly polies, which have a similar um, issue with eating things that they're not supposed to. Um, so yeah, you can use Spinosad and it will help kill back the earwig population, which is a good thing. Um, it's somewhat of a non-selective pesticide though. And so read the directions, make sure it's something you want to use. Um, but in a pinch, it's pretty good for earwigs. Although the problem is they're, they're hard to spray because they're generally out at night or they're in between things where it's hard to get to them and even see where they are. So I, like I said, I like the, the tuna can traps. Those work really good. Okay.
believe it or not, there was more. This is the batch that really didn't have any damage. So I'm expecting these to all be pretty darn good for drying as long as they're ripe enough. It should go pretty fast. I got treats, girls. You guys ready? Here come all the baby turkeys. Not so baby anymore. You can see them right here. One, two, three, four, five, six. So there's six of them. One, two, three, four, five, and then six back there. They love apricots. There you go, girls. A little treat to help cool you off. We are up in my commercial kitchen, which is where my dehydrators live. And we are gonna dehydrate some apricots. Um, I am gonna pre-treat these with ascorbic acid, which is basically just vitamin C. Um, and that acid is gonna help prevent them from browning. There are a bunch of different ways to prevent browning, um, none of which are honestly effective long-term. I mean, in a year, these are gonna be dark. Unless you're sulfuring, and there are ways that you can sulfur your own fruit at home, but most people are not big on having sulfur on their fruit, and it's a bit of a pain to do it. Um, and so I've actually never done that. Um, so what I'm gonna use is this vitamin C. And I bought this at a local um, natural food store. It was in the um, vitamin section. Um, but you could order this on Amazon, I'm sure, if you couldn't find it locally. Um, you can also use Fruit Fresh, which is a version of this with some other things added in. Um, and I have some of that as well. But since I have this absorbic acid, I'm just gonna go ahead and use it. And this is a tablespoon per quart of fruit. Um, and that was two quarts of water that I just put in here. So two tablespoons and two quarts of water. And I am just stirring this with my hand until everything is dissolved. And basically we've just added a little vitamin C to our already pretty vitamin C rich apricots. I am gonna use, I have multiple dehydrators because I do some commercial dehydrating. Um, I'm gonna use this one today. Um, I'm not wild about this dehydrator for everything. However, I think for this purpose, it's gonna be good. Um, because it has one more rack than most of my dehydrators do. It has 10 instead of nine. Um, so I'm gonna be able to get an extra rack in there. And then um, most importantly, it has a tray that fits on the bottom of the, hydra de the dehydrator. These other Excalibur dehydrators do not have a tray in the bottom. And as I mentioned before, if you've got really juicy fruit, that can be a holy disaster. Um, and so it's nice to have a tray. So I'm gonna take advantage of that. I'm kind of selectively picking fruit here that's extra ripe to start. Um, I might end up freezing some of this um, 
for jam as well. And so I'm gonna pick out the extra, extra gooey first. Because the more ripe the fruit, the sweeter it's gonna be when it's dried, and the better it's gonna be as a dried apricot as a snack later. And I'm just gonna treat this as a dip. Um, I'm not sure if normal directions, there's a lot of kind of miscellaneous uh, versions of using absorbic acid where all of the sources that are the expert sources don't necessarily agree. Some call for a tablespoon per quart, some call for less than that. Um, I'm just gonna dip them. I don't think you can, I mean, vitamin C, it's gonna have a, If it, I'm sure if it was a ton on there, it would have a sour taste. Um, but I don't think it's going to hurt anything. So I'm just going to dip these and be done with it rather than like soaking for any length of time. Um, I don't know why I'm doing this right here. This is not really the best spot for it, but we're just going to make it work. All right. I'm going to put these cut side up because they're less likely to drip if the cut side is up. They might take a little longer to dry because of that, because that juice isn't gonna have any place to drip to, but I would rather have it make less of a mess. And so these are gonna shrink as they dry, so I'm gonna put them on here pretty tight. waiting to find a perfect small one to go right there. There we go. And I haven't done dried apricots in several years, um, partly because my apricot tree wasn't producing and partly because we kind of forget we have them. It's one of those things that gets put in a pantry and then I forget that it's there. I also have a tendency to over dry things. And so they're pretty darn chewy. And so, um, yeah, I don't use them as often as I should. I'm trying to rectify that. So I'm gonna try to do a better job this year of not over drying them and then actually remembering that I have them. This other dehydrator right now has some plum fruit leather in it. A friend of mine has this plum tree in their backyard that has these little small uh, purple plums on it that are not freestone, so the seed is pretty well attached. And they were so tiny that they really weren't great for eating out of hand. Um, and so I actually just cooked them down, um, ran them through a food mill to remove the skins and the seeds, uh, and then added some sugar and some pectin um, I'll link a recipe below that I got from a YouTuber on adding pectin to fruit leather to help keep it pliable. And uh, it's an experiment. We'll see how it comes out. I also added a little bit of orange extract and then some a little bit of spice because I make a plum jam that I really love that has um, cinnamon, cardamom, black pepper, and... Um, allspice in it. And so I just, for fun, as I was cooking everything down, I just put a pinch of each one of those in there and then some orange zest or orange extract just to add a little flavor to it because I happen to really like plums with some added extracts. I'm literally doing this by feel. Like I can feel as I'm digging around in there, the ones that are soft. And so I'm not even really having to look at what I'm doing. I'm just kind of going by how do they feel? This is not the ideal. I should have moved this over by the sink. I'm gonna have a mess that I'm gonna to have to wipe up here on the top of this other dehydrator, but it is close to where I'm putting them, which is nice. Sometimes you don't work as smart as you should.
we are planning a week-long camping trip in September and I'm hoping to bring some of this lovely dried fruit on that camping trip it should be nice so I will not be able to get 10 racks in here I'm only going to be able to do five because they're big enough that I can't do every rack I have to do every other um, but I should be able to get a good chunk of this in there and then obviously I have other dehydrators that I could use as well if I decide I want to dehydrate all of them. Um, I'm probably going to dehydrate. I'm guessing I'm going to end up with about six pounds of processed fruit that's going to go into the dehydrator. And then I might just freeze the rest for jam. I am going to hold a little bit out for a recipe coming up YouTube channel that's going to be... Um, apricot chia seed coconut milk pudding and that was something I just kind of randomly came up with a few years ago um, we had a ton of frozen apricots that were they'd been in the freezer for a really long time and they were really soft and ripe when they went into the freezer and I didn't want to use them for jam and so I just thawed them out and turned them into pudding and it turned out to be one of our favorite Desserts. It was just a really nice, fairly light, um, really tasty dessert. So I'll show you that in a future video. And there's some information online about like doing this dip and then adding more vitamin C in. Um, I'm not sure what the assumption there is. I don't know why they would assume it would like, are they thinking it's diluted? after a while by the fruit it's like if it's dissolved in the liquid it doesn't go away i'm not sure why they're suggesting that you continue to add vitamin c after you've done a couple of batches through it i'm not going to bother with that because i'm just not that worried about it all right is there a little one kind of sort of I love when places give you that kind of advice and they don't explain why. It makes me crazy. I'm like, if you don't, if you're not going to tell me why, don't tell me to do it. I really need to understand the why behind things. All right, we will speed up the rest of this. You guys get how this works. There we go. I got more of them in there than I thought I would. So we are going to do 135. And I suspect this is going to take about at least 36 hours. We'll see where we get. We'll start at 24. It's a pretty big piece of fruit. There we go. So we'll come back and check on them in 24 hours. All right, our timer is off. It has been 24 hours. I did come in here and just flip these trays around um, this morning. Uh, and now I'm just gonna check and see for doneness. And honestly, I really think the easiest way to tell if something is adequately dehydrated is just by feel. You can look at it, um, but honest, the like this is bone dry. I can or not bone dry, but dry enough that there's no more moisture in there. Um, I know some of these are not like that one's still got a little bit of softness. That one's still soft. Most of these are probably going to need a few more minutes, or maybe a couple more hours. Um, and then the other interesting thing about drying fruit is you throw it all in the same container together and then you let it sit and they call it conditioning the fruit because some of those fruits are gonna be a little bit more dry. Some of those fruits are gonna be a little bit less dry. Um, and as long as they're all dry enough that they're not gonna mold, um, what's gonna happen is over time, um, the less dry are gonna give up some of their moisture and the more dry are going to um, take up some of that moisture. And so you're gonna end up 
um, equalizing the amount of moisture that's in there um, over time. And so it's a good idea. And see, these are the ones that were in the front. Now they're in the back and they are definitely not, most of them are not quite there. They've still got just a little bit of squishiness to them. So closer to the fan was drier. And then I flipped the tray around. I think I'm gonna do that one. I also rearrange the trays a little bit. I find the ones on the top and the bottom um, tend to be a little less fast in terms of drying than the ones right in the middle. Obviously, make sure your hands are, oops. We'll just taste this, that one, or toss it. Um, you wanna make sure your hands are clean when you're doing this. And I have a tendency to over dry things. I'm trying to learn to not do that. Um, but I'm always so paranoid that I'm gonna have something mold that I have a tendency to dry things until they're just bone dry. And it's fine, but it also makes it very hard to eat them. Um, they're not chewy at all. Um, it's very, very tough to, to snack on them. And so what I usually end up doing is um, storing them and then over time I, when I need to use them I will just add uh, pour boiling water over the fruit and let it sit for 10 or 15 minutes um, and then end up using it in something. Um, I have a recipe that I use a lot of dried fruit with that's kind of like a, a DIY version of like a Laura bar um, where I'm using dates and nuts and then dried fruit and making my own um, power bars, snack, snack. There's a lot of different names for them. Um, I usually do balls when I do them. I roll them into balls and so they're, they're power snack balls. This one, I bet this was on the bottom and I moved it around because it is not nearly as dry as those other two trays. Most of these are not really ready yet. And how these won't dry all at the exact same time because they were different sizes. Um, some were thick. Some were thin, um, some were really huge. Like this one, super squishy still. You can see how wet that is. Um, that is definitely not ready. And I, like I said, I always tend to err on the side of extra caution. Um, I have never had anything that I've dried mold, so there is that. But I've also had a lot of things that I certainly didn't reach for right away because they were really over dried and hard to eat. So it's a trade off, it's a balance. Um, you hate to go through all the work that we went through to get this in here and then have something not be dried enough is dry enough. Um, I also try to weigh like that equilibrium that things are going to balance and so like how much of that is going to help if I have something that's just a little bit maybe could have gone another hour versus something too dried out. Are they going to balance out? Things don't have to be completely dry in order not to mold. It's actually about water activity. And once um, the fruit is still hanging on to um, the moisture that it's gonna hang on to, that moisture is never gonna be available for bacteria to grow. Um, that's a very rudimentary definition of that. Um, you can look up water activity, food safety online and read lots about that if you want to. It plays a role in a lot of home canning as well. Um, but I will look up some numbers from dehydrator manuals on like how, how dry is dry enough um, in terms of safety and not worrying about things molding um, because it doesn't have to be bone dry. 
And you know that because you buy dried fruit at the grocery store in bags, and it's clearly not bone dry, and yet it seems to last pretty much forever. So, all right. So that's a first pass on this. Um, I would say, oh, maybe we'll give this another three hours and then recheck. Um, and some of these, we might have to do this process two or three times to get them all where we want them. So again, 135, we'll set this for three hours. And see where we end up. All right, we're back. I would like to tell you that it's three hours later. The reality is it's three hours that the dehydrator continued to be on and then it's the next day because I got busy and I had other things I needed to do. And it's totally fine when these things are this dry for them to sit on the racks. Um, but we should be, most of these should be done at this point. Yeah, these are again, a little bit bendy, but definitely feeling, I'm not feeling any super squishy spots for the most part, maybe that one. And I didn't weigh these before we put them on the racks, but I would guess it was at least six pounds and that's cleaned. Um, so even more than that before they were pitted um, of apricots and probably I'm guessing closer to 10. There's quite a bit. So it's amazing how much fruit you can dry um, pretty quickly with a dehydrator. It is a really nice way of preserving things. Getting a little bit of squish. Again, trying to decide how picky I want to be. And as you remember, we dunked these in ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, to help keep them from turning brown. Um, there are other things you can do, including citric acid um, or fruit fresh. Fruit fresh is actually vitamin C mostly, although there's some other things in it. Um, studies have shown that citric acid, which you may have on hand because you use it in canning, I know I do, um, does not work as well. Uh, so it works, but it's not nearly as effective as vitamin C is. I don't know why that is, but that's what the experts at extension offices say. So it's worth seeking out the ascorbic acid instead of um, using citric. And again, these are gonna brown over time in storage. Be sure to label your jars. I have made the mistake in past years of drying peaches and apricots both and thinking, oh, I can tell the difference because one is different color than the other. And then like six months later, I could not tell them apart and like literally had to reconstitute them in some water to, to eat them to be able to figure out which one was which. So. Um, yeah, be sure to label your jars because it is not going to be as obvious as you think it's going to be. All right, I'm just going to consolidate everything that needs a little bit more time all onto one rack for no good reason other than it makes my little organizational heart happy. That was my dog, if you heard him in the background. I have a dachshund. You've seen him probably in some videos, Charlie. He's a dachshund blue healer mix. And boy, does he ever have a dachshund bark. When he barks at something, it is just so sharp. It goes right through your head. He is charming as all get out, though, and he knows it. So he's literally everybody's favorite dog when they come to visit. These look much better. Again, different places in this dehydrator have better or worse um, air circulation. It's a subtle difference, but you will find that some racks dry quicker than others. 
and it's worth rotating them around um, and flipping them when you're drying just for that reason. By the way, you guys, these smell amazing. And I'm not quite sure why, but it's almost as if they are coated in vanilla. The, um, the smell as they, these have been drying has just been wonderful. All right, so we're gonna go back to 135. And honestly, I don't think we need more than two hours for that last little bit. We're getting there. All right, it's the next day again. And the last of our apricots should be dry. That was good. Come over here where I can, oh yeah. Those are excellent. Ta-da! So we've turned what I would guess to be about 10 to 12 pounds of apricots into this. So it's a great way, and these will, basically these are shelf stable for easily a year and I've honestly kept them for probably four or five years at times. They will keep for a very long time. Um, great way to dry fruit. You can chop these up and put them in granola. You can soak them a little bit and then put them into with dates and nuts and make your own kind of Laura bars or power bars. Um, or you can just snack on them. Um, they're really nice just in a trail mix or out of hand. So great use for um, stone fruit this time of year when you have an abundance of them and you don't want to make yet another batch of jam. And for the record, these taste fantastic. I kind of nailed the dryness. They're a little bit chewy, nicely sweet, um, not too dry, perfect. <laughs> 